And Blassie had two sets of false teeth, one he'd eat with and another pair he'd file down on TV. Then he would bite the wrestlers in the head in Japan, <laughs> suck the blood out of their head, then spit it back in their face. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious, bro. I'm serious. And on TV Asai, <sighs> on TV Asai, the first weekend Blassie wrestled on TV, three old ladies passed out and died. Oh at home. my God. Please, now, this I is a Fred video. Blassie story I need telling video me. On this. That is insane. So, this is Blassie <laughs> telling me this stuff. So, now I've got Matt Suda and I'm going over there with Blassie. And Ricky Dozan was the mafia guy. He ended up getting get killed by a mafia guy over in Japan. But now I've, I got this backstory of Matt Suda and Blassie. That's why I stayed over there 22, 24 weeks out of the year. It was like, I loved it over there. That's amazing. Yeah, it was great. And they don't, don't call me Hulk Hogan over there. They call me Ichiban there. Oh. Yeah, so whenever you see me with those black and silver tights, that's the Ichiban number one logo on my tights. And so. That's a, that's incredible. So that's a, what a great place to, to experience the different styles of uh, pro wrestling too, right? Because like American style pro wrestling versus Japanese style. And then there's like uh mexican styles a different styles well right yeah how many oh, different yeah. how many oh, yeah. different styles of pro wrestling are there is it, it's bigger in america and bigger in it, japan it, than anywhere else right well but it's, it's it, lucha labor is a different thing because when you see anybody in america boom they take your arm they take your left arm mm -hmm. they always work off the left side everything you do mexico they work off the right side okay my first time my first time i was in mexico city I was in that big arena that has the hole in the roof, in Mexico City, the big building. Yeah. And I'm in a six-man tag. They put me in a six-man tag for some reason. I don't do tag matches. I got two Mexican partners who don't speak English, and there's three other Mexican guys who don't speak English. They don't even tag over there. You know, you usually have to wait to get the tag. They, they're just running out of the ring with no tag. It took me like 10 minutes to figure out that you didn't need to tag. Nobody uh. told me. You know, so it was just crazy. But the stuff they do is just like a whole nother level. You know, the Eddie Guerreros and Chavo yeah. Guerreros and all these guys, man, they're in Rey Mysterio. These guys are just supermen. Wild you know? acrobatics. Yeah, yeah they're, and, and they can wrestle, too. I mean, Chavo's the man. He, he has his whole family, you know, was they're, they're, they're legends. Yeah. So in the 70s when you were first getting going, did, how many different organizations were there? Were there, like, small local places, and then there's one big one that was on television? Like, how many different organizations were there back then? Like, when I grew up, I saw Florida Championship Wrestling, you know, and I saw that's the only thing I saw, you know. So that was, like, a local? Yeah, yeah it was just a local like, promotion. Was it cable back then? No, no, no. no. It was regular just TV. local TV, and we didn't get Channel 17, Ted Turner's cable. And we and at the time I didn't know that there was Madison Square Garden, New York territory. That is New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. And then there was like Minnesota, Vern Gagne's territory. Then there was Fritz von Erich, Dallas. Bill Watts had Louisiana. Michael LaBelle had LA. So there were all these little teeny territories, and all the all the promoters respected each other. So if Joe Rogan had Texas, I would never come in to Dallas and try to run a show in your area. There are these imaginary boundaries that you don't mm. cross your respect. That was Vince McMahon <laughs> Sr. Yeah. And he was loyal to all these promoters. And every once in a while, he'd send, like, superstar Billy Graham down to Florida to wrestle or Ox Baker from New York down to wrestle. And we'd see these guys come in, and I didn't know where they came from. But they'd come in, and the local hero, like Dusty Rhodes, would beat them up, and they'd be gone. Mm. So I had no idea how the whole system worked. And all I saw was Florida Championship Wrestling. So after I got in and I figured out all these territories, you know, like I went to uh, Minnesota and wrestled, and I went to North Florida, the Fuller Territory, which is Pecola, and all through Mobile, Alabama, and Birmingham, that small territory. I went to Memphis and worked for Lawler and Jerry Jarrett for a while. But then when I went to work for Vince Jr., and I went back after being fired and having my first run in New York, when I went back in 84 to beat the Iron Sheik, Vince wanted to cross all the imag all those imaginary boundaries, you know, and I went, wow, this is going to be dangerous. So Vince says, are you up for it? I said, yeah, I'll do it. And so Vince stayed in, in Connecticut and in Greenwich in the office, and, you know, then I was booked in Lafayette, Louisiana. We pump our signal in there for like eight weeks. You know, prime example is Kansas City. I don't know if you ever heard of a wrestler named Harley Race. Yeah, of course. NWA champion. 
tougher than hell, meaner than a snake. Great guy, though, okay? We pumped the signal into Kansas City for eight weeks. And Harley Race has been there like 18 years. He was the NWA champion. I'm the champion of the world, and he's a very proud and mean son of a bitch. And all of a sudden, here comes this blonde-haired idiot from New York going, hey, I'm the WWF champion. I'm the <laughs> WWE champion. I'm coming to Kemper Arena. And we're pumped the signal. So I come, I fly into town, and I show up about 2 in the afternoon. My guys call me. Harley Race came down here with a gun. He tried to light the ring on fire. Whoa. And the co- had the cops ran, ran him up, and they didn't arrest him. I went, oh, shit. And they told me, Harley said, when I show up, he's going to kill you. So I go across the street, and I go to the Rusty Scupper, this bar, right? And I'm not- I was notorious at the time for not kind of like being on time because the matches would start like at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and they wanted you to the building at 6.30. I'd come rolling at about 9.30, you know, after intermission. And I'd have time to put my boots on because I don't want to talk about wrestling. I just want to go do it. Mm. You know, it's like playing guitar or anything. It's like chess. You think two, three moves ahead. And so now I don't need to be at the building early. I damn sure don't want to run into Harley Race. And this guy's going to kill me. I'm scared to death of him anyway. I've known him since I was a kid. You know, so now I'm across the rusty scupper drinking bottles of wine, drinking bottles of wine. But anyway, like going down to Puerto Rico. First time we go down to Puerto Rico, I've never been to Puerto Rico before. All the boys tell me how violent it is. They cut you, they burn you with cigarettes, they throw everything at you in Puerto Rico. So I'd never been, I didn't need to go. But now Vince wants to go down to Puerto Rico. And Carlos Colon had the territory there for like 30 or 40 years. So here we come. And I go rolling down to Puerto Rico with Cindy Lauper with me, right? <laughs> so I go down to Puerto Rico and we have the match and we sell out the stadium. Me and Macho Man go back to the room, and we go walk in his room, and his room is trashed. His room is trashed. And so all of a sudden, I go, oh, my God, let me go to my room. So all of a sudden, I go to my room, and I don't want to say the guy's name, but when I open the, the door, he's sitting there, and because he's still really active, and he's sitting there with a gun. He says, if you ever come back here, I'm going to kill you. I said, okay. That, I was going back to Tampa. I hauled ass to the airport. I got on an Eastern Airlines flight, the last one out of town, and flew to L.A. I was supposed to be going home to Tampa. About four months later, Bruiser Brody goes down there, has a little argument. The booker calls him into the shower, cuts his throat, and kills him. Jesus Christ. So that's down there in Puerto Rico. 